Okay, so good morning everyone and welcome to this morning's webinar. Uh, today we're going to talk about careers in dairy farming and we have a, a large panel of people available to us today. So we've Gordon Peppard, who's the farm structure specialist, Paddy Kelly, who works on uh, collaborative farming arrangements as a research officer in Chagas, John Moriarty, who's uh, working on the Nefertiti project, who, which you'll talk about in TUI in a few minutes. And then we have David Fogarty and Keen Job, who are both farm managers currently, uh, David in County Wexford and Keen in County Longford, who are going to tell you about their career paths to where they're working at the moment. So I'm just going to hand over to John to talk about the Nefertiti project just briefly, which is part of today's uh, presentation. So, John, I'll hand over to you there. So. Okay, thanks, Stuart. Um, the, so the Nefertiti project is a, a EU Horizon 2020 project that Chagas has been involved in for the last two years. Um, it involves 32 partners from 17 countries, and the aim of the project is to uh, run a series of on-farm demonstrations on a range of 10 topics. So um, the topic in this network, Network 10, is farm attractiveness, um, where we look to encourage young people to uh, um, consider careers in agriculture. So um, normally we run on-farm demos, um, so we, we've had a number of them um, last year and earlier this year, and we, we've now gone online. Um, yeah, so the, the overall aim is to uh, promote careers in daring and then to evaluate our um, demonstrations and improve future on-farm demonstrations throughout the EU. So, yeah, that's it, Stuart. Okay, thanks, John, and thanks for your um, involvement in getting the, today's webinar together. So, uh, no problem. Colin, you there now, Gordon, to go through your slides in relation to the collaborative farming arrangements, please. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As Stuart says, my name is Gordon Peppard and I deal with uh, the collaborative farming um, in, in agriculture. So today I'm just going to look at some of the collaborative pathways for dairy farmers. And I'm just going to start by giving them um, an overview maybe from a, from a family point of view. So Stuart, if you can just click to the next slide. So look, um, the pathways from a family point of view, you'll have the existing farmer who's there, that maybe the father or the mother, in a lot of situations, you'll have a young trained farmer who's coming back to the, to the farm. That could be a son or a daughter or could even be a favorite niece or nephew. And over time, that farm, by gift or inheritance, whether the parents decide to transfer it while they're living or when they pass on, uh, that farm is generally transferred and it be, it's inherited by the young trained farmer. I suppose as some of the pathways um, that can be used there in, as an intermediate, as a stepping stone, to keep everyone involved is the first one there's the registered farm partnership so we'll talk about that a little bit further in a minute and if you just click again Stuart you'll see there's a, another step there and you can bring in a succession farm partnership which is an agreement there between the the parents and the son or daughter that the farm will be transferred between the end of year three and the end of year 10 of the partnership agreement well a minimum of 80 percent has to be transferred up to 100 percent can be transferred so if we, if we go on then to some of the non-family uh, pathways. So again, you'll have the existing farmer uh, who's farming away on the farm at the moment. In, in some cases, that farmer may want to step back a little bit from the farm and maybe, maybe might look at exit and dairy, and, but would still like to do something with the land and maintain it. So uh, in, there is opportunities there at the moment for contract heifer rearing, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But some of the collaborative pathways there then where they can link up with young trained farmers. And these are farmers that are no relation to the existing farmer. So we've three of them along here on the bottom. And um, the first one is, is share farming. Again, um, these farmers can join a registered farm partnership um, or they can do a long-term land leasing arrangement. So they're just some of the collaborative arrangements that are available. And I'm just briefly going to discuss the three of those today. We probably could spend a half an hour on each one of them, but I'm just going to very briefly uh, discuss each one of them. So the first one there then that we're going to discuss is um, the registered farm partnerships. So the registered farm partnership is, is a relationship that subsists between persons carrying on a business in common with a view to a profit. So it's where the farmers are one business to use the one farm have one business structure and to generate an income for for 
for two for two or three or, or more parties there. I suppose why would people go into a registered farm partnership? Well, I suppose there's there's sort of two benefits uh, from from that we the way we see it. You have the physical benefits and you have uh, also financial benefits. So if, if we look at the physical benefits first, there by bringing in a young person into the partnership, you're bringing in a huge um, set of increased skills. They're 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 generally highly educated people now. They're coming in with great uh, in ingenuity, energy, a willingness to drive on, where maybe the older person or the experienced farmer has brought the farm as far as they can, and now they just need the, the bit of invigoration into the farm to drive it on to the next level. So you have the sharing of work then as well, which, which uh, hopefully will, will increase efficiency. Um, the main aim here as well is to have a better work-life balance, that now you can organize your work week, you can get a weekend off for from milking and um, you don't have to get up every night calving cows etc so hopefully you get a better work-life balance for all partners involved and you can go and do some things outside of farming that you enjoy there's also an opportunity to increase scale maybe land will become available close by for for lease or, or purchase and it gives an opportunity to to increase the stock and rate the output on the farms by and large uh, partnership farms are generally safer because now you always have a second or third person around when you're doing the jobs whether it be dosing cattle move them on the road etc so hopefully these will become safer farms i suppose then if we go over to the other side of the the coin we have the financial benefits and some of the key benefits there of registered farm partnerships if the partnership is set up in a way that you can maximize income at the low income tax rate so everyone is entitled to 35,300 euro at the low income tax bracket. So potentially if you had three partners all with a 33% a share, you potentially could have over 105,000 um, at the low income tax bracket. There's then the added benefit of stock relief. The general stock relief from farms is 25%, but a young trained farmer in a partnership will get 100% stock relief on his um, ratio of the profit sharing ratio. So if he's a 50% profit sharing ratio, he will get a 50% of the stock, he'll get 100% stock relief and 50% of the increase. The TAMS grants then are um, a very encouraging uh, grant there that will help develop farms. So an individual at the moment can get up to 80,000 of an investment whereas two people in a partnership will have a pot of money of 160,000 that they can get grant aided on. And if you have a young trained farmer there, the first 80,000 will be at 60% and the second 80,000 will be at 40%. If we look then at the basic payment scheme incentives, well, there is the young farmer scheme top up there, which is roughly about 67 or eight euro for a, for a qualifying young trained farmer on up to 50 entitlements. So again, over 3,000 euro there of an incentive from the basic payment scheme, if, if it applies. There's then a collaboration grant. So there is costs associated with setting up a partnership and they could be costs that are borne by the accountant or a solicitor or an agricultural advisor. Any costs that are associated with setting up of the partnership, um, you can get 50% of that back up to a spend of 5,000 euro. So, Again, there's a number there of financial benefits which could be quite beneficial. We go on again, Stuart. Uh, and the final one there, we spoke about the succession farm partnership where there's a requirement to transfer 80% of the farm assets between the end of year three and year 10. But the one additional bonus of the succession farm partnership is the partnership gets a 5,000 euro tax credit for five years. Now, they won't get it the year that the successor turns 40 but if they if the timing is correct they can get up to twenty five thousand euro tax credit there over five years so if we go on again so then if we move to share farming a share share farming is slightly different in that it's two separate businesses being run on the one farm and and everyone shares the outputs so it's it's basically an agreement between the landowner and share farmer and negotiations have to take place here 
that it's viable for both people to, to make a living and to, to draw enough out of the one farm. Um, I suppose, why would you go into share farming? From a landowner's point of view, often there's no successor on the farm, or maybe there is a successor, but they're not ready to come home. Um, so from that point of view, um, the landowner can keep his uh, farm running as a functional farm, but he, he now has the added advantage of bringing in a younger person who's, who's supplying labor and uh, maybe bringing in cows and bringing in expertise. From the share farmer's point of view, um, there's a huge number of opportunities there for someone who's no access to land, but is, is really keen to farm and, and has worked on farms and is really wanting to take on their own, own business opportunities. So there's a great opportunity here for someone with no access to land. So then how do, how do you go about setting up a share farming agreement? Well, I suppose we'd look at it in three separate uh, phases. I suppose the first phase is, is putting the plan together. So I suppose you, you have all the legal, the financial, the communication, which is essential. You, you need to have good communication with, with, with the landowner, with the share farmer, etc. The second phase then will be the operational phase where plans are put in place of how this share farming agreement is going to work when it is up and running. So who, whose responsibility for what, how will it work, when, when will it be done, etc. So a very important phase. And then I suppose finally the, the third one on it is the exit plan. And it's probably not one we really feel we should be discussing at the beginning of a plan, but it, it is an important that these do have a lifespan and it is important to know how at the end of the lifespan that you will exit out of the share farming arrangement and what the conditions of that will be. So plan, 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 I suppose, is the, is the key message on share farming. If we look briefly then at long-term land leasing, it's another, it's another um, way that uh, young farmers can get into dairy farming. And I suppose I'm just going to tell the long-term land leasing through maybe a story you see there on the right hand side a picture of James and Alfred. They were two farmers that um, I dealt with there in the last number of years. And Alfred was a, a man in his mid to late 50s. He was in suckler, suckler cows a couple of years ago. A uh, single man, he felt that the workload was getting heavy. Uh, the beef wasn't going exceptionally good at the time. James was a developing dairy farmer beside him and he was willing to uh, expand. So Alfred uh, long-term leased James uh, 40 acres, which added to James's milk and platform. So I suppose it was a win-win situation in that Alfred reduced the workload. He, he reduced the exposure to volatile beef prices. Uh, he had guaranteed income from his, his leasing of his land, and all of that leased income was, was tax-free. From James's point of view, he increased his milk and platform. The Alfred's land was actually closer than some of his own land. So he put, he put a hole in the hedge, put in a farm roadway, and he increased his milking platform by um, 40 acres and increased cow numbers by between 50 and 60. So it really sort of justified the investment for James because he had security of tenure and he knew that he was going to be in that land for the next 10 years. So that's the long-term land leasing, uh, Stuart. Uh, briefly, just looking at the contract heifer rearing, I suppose this is maybe an opportunity for someone that maybe wants to step back from dairy farming or maybe wants an alternative enterprise than, than beef, sheep or tillage. What are the benefits to the dairy farmer? I suppose it simplifies the system. It gets all the replacements off farm. They now have one group of animals to look after, which is the dairy cow. Um, it brings in additional land, labour and facilities, which can be sometimes difficult to source and maybe expensive to source. And hopefully it will in, improve your work-life balance. But now you have all these um, replacements, animals off the farm, whether they be calves or maiden heifers, and you have more time to spend managing your cows and making those more efficient and hopefully more profitable. From the contract rarer's point of view, it reduces their exposure to the volatile beef prices if, they're, if they were previously in beef. It gives them a regular cash flow. And I suppose they don't have to go to the bank looking for huge stocking loans. So there's less investment in, in their livestock. And I suppose then just to, to conclude, 
the collaborative pathways, uh, Stuart, are, I suppose, they're business arrangements, so they have to be financially solid. They have to make financial sense um, for everyone to, to be involved in them. They have to make a living. I suppose the one great thing about them is that there's a huge number of options and opportunities available and probably more to come in the, in the years to come. Since milk quotas were abolished in 2015, uh, there has been a lot of opportunities out there and, and there will be more. I suppose every individual needs to assess what best suits their own needs. And with the different collaborative pathways, not every one of them might suit you, but some hopefully one of them will. And I suppose just to finally wrap up then, within any of the collaborative messages, trust, flexibility, have an open mind, and communication are essential. Um, I suppose if you look at it from the three S's point of view, you need skills, support, and the structure then. So I suppose the skills comes down to having um, good people management skills, good management skills, and I suppose excellent communication skills. The supports then look, uh, avail of the advisory um, regulatory um, bodies, uh, talk to fellow farmers and colleagues and use whatever mentors you can to get your uh, collaborative farming off the ground and then decide on your structure, whether that be a registered farm partnership, share farming or long-term land leasing. So look, that's a brief overview of the collaborative pathways from my, from my side. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Gordon. Um, so I'll just uh, move to Kean there now. So I'll just get you to start your video there, Kean, please. So uh, Kean, um, you're farming in County Langford now, having been involved in farming in County Cork over the road from where I am here at the moment, and also in the Midlands uh, during the course of your uh, short but in, in, intensive career, I suppose, in the in the last number of years. Um, mm -hmm. I'll just start by asking you in relation to how things are going in Langford at the moment. Um, you were telling me there last night that you actually were suffering a small bit from the dry weather, which might come as a surprise to many people for farms in the West. Uh, yeah, so we were burned up fairly bad. We had no rain here for six weeks. Um, started feeding a small bit of silage up the meal to the cows, but We've got 70 metre rain now in the last 10 days, so we're back on track. We grew 100 there, grew, measured yesterday. So. Very good. So we're back on, on, the, on the, the wagon again as such. Yeah. So look, um, th thanks for just giving us the update on the farm at the moment. So I suppose what we want you to tell us about today, of course, is your um, career so far. So I suppose we'll start off with where you've come from and how you've gotten to where you are now, I suppose. Uh, so in terms of where you're from originally, your your background in terms of uh, farming and uh, how you've started along the, the path that you've taken. So, Yeah, um, from a 20 hectare suckler farm, um, my father was working off farm all the time, so it was just a small, not making much money, uh, started relief making then when I was about 14 or 15. And um Realised the potential for a career in maybe farm management or something like it. Uh, when I finished school, I done the level five and six in Ballyhays Agricultural College, and completed uh, both my placements on 150 cow plus farms. So that really opened my eyes to the larger scale of the thing and multi labour unit farms and the possibility of of uh, a career. So when I was finished my level six, I completed the level seven diploma in dairy farm management in Cork in Moor Park there. Um, and this course entails two 12 month placements and uh, once a month, three days in Moor Park uh, for block release and lectures with uh, Chagas researchers. Uh, so for my first year, I was with Kevin and Margaret Toomey in Cork, making 350 cows. Uh, loved it there. And then after that, I went to New Zealand for six months to Canterbury, where we were making 1,400 cows. So I'd done a calving season there. And the following January, which was January 2018, I came back and went to David Baker in Boron County, Offaly. Uh, to complete the calving season there. Um, 
and graduated from the course then in September of 2018 and went back to work with Kevin and Margaret for a year, um, managing their home farm, which was uh, 450 cows by that stage. So I got a chance then to manage that for the first time and um, really enjoyed it there. And of course, there was an expansion project in process at the time as well there, so that was probably a challenge as well, was it? Yeah, so he he was just expanding that year, so it was good to see that, and we, there was a bit of construction going on and stuff on farms, so it was good to be part of all of that. A good experience. Um, so then I always kind of knew that I wanted to come back closer to home at some stage. I suppose I felt that there's more career possibilities or land possibilities in the future here. There's, I suppose, a lot bigger farms becoming available and not as much competition from established dairy farmers up here. Um, so the Finn family here in Ballymahan in Longford uh, started into cows in this spring gone by uh, and they offered me the job last year. So I took it up and started managing this farm last November. And I suppose the interesting thing from my point of view, Kian, is that uh, you actually have I know you're the farm manager, but you have a significant level of, of control in terms of how the farm is operating now. The family have given you a lot of responsibility very quickly. Yeah, in fairness, they've been great that way. Um, but they've had no, they never milked cows before this spring. Uh, so the grass, all that was new to them. So that's kind of in my control. There's a lot of... Um, reseeding, building work and stuff going on at the minute. So they kind of oversee all that. And I would do most of the farming and they help out with milkings and any time I need them, they, they come and help out. But in terms of the, the general day-to-day running of the the dairy herd, that's kind of completely in my control. Um, and they're learning to learning to do it as, as we go along as well. Okay, very good. And uh, I suppose then um, the question is, of course, you've already shown your, I suppose, aspirations in terms of, or mentioned your aspirations about getting involved in the large block in the West, we'll say, and seeing the scope up there. The future plans, uh, what are they for you? So I would hope in the next couple of years to do share farming with the lads, something like what Gordon mentioned. Um, just have to look at the different options and what will suit us best. Uh, long term, I suppose, within the next five to seven years, I'd like to lease my own block of land and start my own for the cows. Um, while also probably staying involved with the lads at, at some level. Very good. So I suppose I'll just call on your party there now, seeing as you're the, the man with the, I suppose, the most experience of all of us in, on the call in relation to share farming arrangements. And I suppose just to, I think Gordon has made some excellent points there in terms of uh, what's required for all of the collaborative farm range, farming arrangements, but I suppose in particular the share farming arrangements, and Kean has touched on it there, that he's hoping to get into that. So I suppose what advice would you give him in terms of the, the structure that he has to put in place with, uh, with the Finns when they are going about this? Yeah, thanks, Stuart. I think um, the first thing I suppose that strikes me about Keen's story is the amount of excellent experience he's got before he's looking and getting into arrangement. I think that's a really important point that everyone would take from uh, the, the webinar today is that there's no rush getting into an arrangement like this because it, it is a big undertaking and taking a couple of years to work as, as Keen did on larger scale farms is a fantastic way of developing your skills, as Gordon said, before you, you step into the structure. Um, so I suppose just a li- little bit about share farming would be um, how in this case it might work at the moment Keen I suppose receives a salary as farm manager um, so with share farming instead of getting a set salary he would get a percentage of the milk check uh, and pay for a percentage of the probably the variable costs on the farm like maybe the feed and the normal and the, the fertilizer um, paying for we'll say a percentage of them and, and really I suppose what it does is it gives it gives Keen a chance to really get rewarded for the management of the farm um, and then as he for example if he invested in more cows in the farm and, the, and and he was allowed to own more cows he would get a greater percentage of the milk check and pay for a greater percentage of the costs um, to financially reward him for the assets that he's contributing. Well, likewise, the Finns have to make sure that they're getting rewarded for the assets that they've contributed in terms of the development, the farm that they own, and everything else. 
Uh, so that's kind of a general overview of, of how it would work. I suppose then, Paddy, as well, like there's, uh, where, whereas there's a, probably more of a structure in relation to the succession firm partnerships and the firm partnerships themselves, the share farming arrangements are probably a lot more varied in the in their structures in terms of how they're set up, depending, like you said there, on the assets that people own, maybe coming into them or what the share firm are coming in. And, and we'll say, for example, in Keane's case, is bringing in to the table, I suppose, as well, is it? Yeah, absolutely. You'd, I suppose, what the, the process you would go through is you'd look at, um, you'd, you'd you'd promote a kind of an asset an asset value on what uh, we'll say that the owners are bringing to the situation in terms of the amount of land, uh, the investment that they've put in, and then on the other side you'd look at it and you'd say, well, let's say Keen or or the share farmer is going to supply the labour to the farm and also is going to supply some of the cows, uh, and there's a kind of a set formula we use then to calculate whether it'll be a a sixty forty split or a fifty fifty split or that kind of thing, and you basically and I suppose it, it shows how good the business relationship has to be that you'd basically run a budget for the next five years with the two parties and say, look, this is how we're going to split the income and expenses. This is the return to me. This is the return to E. Uh, you know, are, are we are we happy with that? He'll go through the negotiation process, and as you said, you know, there could be a bit of well, we're happy to pay for a bit more of that, or you're contributing to this. So, negotiation comes into it, and that's that's where you need to have the the business skills and be comfortable with that side of farming yourself and the budgeting and that kind of thing. Yeah, and I suppose the the other thing I, that I like about the way Keen is operating there now, obviously, it's a startup farm in Longford, and uh, but he's finding his way and I suppose there's two sides to it like the Finns have to be comfortable with Keen and Keen has to be comfortable with the Finns as well so he's not diving into the share farming arrangement um, and I think a very valid point that Gordon made there about the exit plan you probably have to build you have to build the exit plan as if it is going to fall apart really in order to to uh, exit and like Keen has said there with aspirations maybe to go out on his own eventually as well maybe that share farming arrangement will continue like you said or may, maybe it won't but just that, that it's very important not to get sucked in by the the will and the want to actually get involved in the setup in the first place and to forget about how we might actually exit this at the end as well so I suppose the would you care to comment I suppose you've already said about the excellent work experience that Keen got along the way before he's gone into this gone to his own situation but just in terms of not rushing into arrangements, I suppose, is what I'm trying to get at, really. Yeah, there, and there's two points I'd make. One is, um, you know, Gordon mentioned it, uh, th- there's going to be loads of opportunities out there. I, I've absolutely no doubt that um, there's going to be lots of opportunities for people to get into dairy farming in Ireland. You know, there, there has been already, and quotas have only been gone for five years, and, and I see that trend continuing because of, you know, there's a significant cohort of, of farmers out there that are probably 60 plus with no successor and are thinking about what their options are. Um, so I think there'll be loads of opportunities. And, and I think um, th- the really important one is, you know, the, the right opportunity and, and the right opportunity starts first and foremost with the right person. But the right opportunity, um, you know, run well with a good person. It can be a brilliant business. It can be very profitable. It can be very enjoyable. Um, but, you know, stepping into the wrong opportunity and as you said, Stuart, that, that the hassle of something having to finish or winding up because partners have different expectations, that can really set you back, you know. So there's, I would say there's absolutely no rush. Uh, find the right people. Uh, and also, like I would say, and, and, and uh, Gordon mentioned it, make sure that it's big enough that both parties can get financially what they want, want out of it. Because, you know, even if it's a good working relationship and at the end of the day, uh, you can't, you know, the parties aren't going to get enough. That's not sustainable either. So there's, there's a lot of work. There's a huge amount of work in setting up these arrangements. But when you put the work in at the start and you get everyone clear on, on what's involved, then it can operate. You know, you, you can put a lot of work into signing up, for example, the share farming contract, and it might not be needed to be looked at at all for the next five years because everything is clear, you know. So definitely putting the work in at the start. So giving a time is the other thing then as well. So like not jumping in, oh, we need to get something sorted for the 1st of February next year. It may be February 12 months that you actually start the arrangement and you might even take the opportunity that Keen has taken to run the farm for the 12 months as an employee initially and see how it progresses. Now, I suppose, Keen, just to come back to you there briefly because as in, in preparation for today, you made a comment to me and uh, about about the people side of things again and how important that is. And what it kind of what resonated with me is that I, in in my role as an advisor, I've seen people to take slightly less money in order to get the right tenant in a long-term leasing scenario. So 
they were offered a pot of gold, but they weren't sure about the tenant maybe that they were getting offered the pot of gold by. And they they took a, a lesser offer because they were more sure about the person. And you're making a kind of a similar comment in terms of how critically important that personal relationship is for both your role currently as the farm manager on the farm, but also in particular if you progress to the share farming arrangement that you get on really, really well and have a good understanding of one another. Uh, yeah. So as I was saying to Stuart yesterday evening, um, I've seen a lot of people, or a lot of talk was going on about our contracts and salaries and stuff when we were graduating. And I just thought that not, maybe not a lot of talk has been put into who this person was and is it the right person to be getting involved with. Um, I've been lucky enough to you know, work with some great people the last few years and the lads are the very same. We, we've get, got on very well so far. Um, so yeah, it's just it's quite often that maybe the big salary is there for a reason because they can't <laughs> they can't hold on to people and they need to offer big salaries to try and attract staff. Yeah, so it's just uh, I think it's it's a very worthy point for like I, I looking at the list of people that are on here, the names that I do recognise are young people that maybe have aspirations of following the role that you're you're after following, Keen, and it's important that people are clear on that that it's not necessarily all about the money which the people that might own the land might think is brilliant but um it's uh it's really important that the relationship nearly about a couple of thousand euro won't make up for agro every day of the year yeah and just as well on the point about um not rushing into it like we were talking about going straight into the share farm i had in calf heifers on my own and ended up just selling them off because we we didn't really know each other at the time or up until last November, we didn't know one another that well at all. So, um, sold them and said we give it two years to have a trial period and go from there. Then, but I have no doubt in my mind that it probably we should get on very well over the two years. Excellent stuff. So, um, we'll just uh, stop the two e there now for a brief while, and we'll call on David to to tell tell us his story. So, David, you're down in County Wexford at the moment, uh, born to a cinder. Um, yeah, down in County Wexford, I suppose we're we're not too bad. We we didn't get as burnt as other places, probably up in Carlow, Kilkenny, Leash, up across the Midlands. Um, we we were lucky to be getting bits and pieces of rain. Although our our growth did drop back to about thirty seven there, probably for a week or ten days. But um, we've got plenty of rain now. We've nearly five inches of rain got now in June, so we're we're well out of drought now at this stage and um, seems to be a bit more coming so yeah we're we're just kind of recovered there now in the last few days um, and you know we're we've our meal cut back and silence dropped out and everything is you know everything is fairly rosy again a few semi paddocks and stuff to be taken care of um, we're we're sorting out some of them today and I suppose the rest of them will hopefully be sorted over the next rotation um, so yeah no big relief to, to get a nice bit of rain there um, other than that, yeah, everything is everything is going fairly well on the farm. Um, cows are milking fairly well, and breeding seems to have gone fairly well so far. Anyway, so yeah, happy out. Very good. So you're nearly close to knocking it into neutral now to cruise away into the back end of the year. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, you know, hopefully, yeah. No, it'll be nice. Um, it's actually been a. I suppose it's actually been a. The first half of the year has kind of been heavy going between wet weather and you know COVID and all this kind of stuff so it, it has kind of been a different spring but yeah no it's it's grand now to kind of have everything behind us and the, you know we've plenty of silage and stuff now so yeah cruising enough hopefully for the next few weeks very good so just in terms of your own career Pat so similar to Keen, um you're in Wexford now about 10 months um but you've worked on a number of farms in the last couple of years as well and you started out in in UCD doing the ag degree there yeah, so I went to, uh, yeah, started in UCD in 2010 and did animal and crop production. So, so probably the, the most general or the more general of the ag degrees there it was kind of a toss up between ACP and dairy business. Um, dairy business was in its, I think its second year when I started up there. Um, but yeah, it shows animal and crop. You know, did a lot of thinking about it at the time, and as it probably turned out, it, it didn't really make much much different in, difference in the long run. Um, yeah, so finished finished there in twenty fourteen, and then kind of spent a year kind of around home doing different things. wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. Did a bit of work with Chagas on derogations and stuff like that. Um, and then I suppose twelve months twelve months after I graduated, then I went to New Zealand. Um, and with 
wouldn't have been I wouldn't have counted myself as a big cow person up up until then. And you know, even going to New Zealand, I, you know, I wasn't even sure whether it was the right thing to be doing or not. But went and I suppose was lucky to, you know, to to get to work for some some really good farmers out there. Um, uh, you know, uh, pretty you know very grass based systems, I suppose. Um, and yeah, nice farms all around country, and learned learned quite a lot off of off off those tree farms, and are still in contact with with the tree farmers on and off. So yeah, definitely a good. Um, it was definitely a, a, a good a good time for me. Um, it was good just to get away from home as well. And, you know, you see different things, and it kind of broadens your mind. And you know, it definitely it definitely would have changed my attitude to dairy farm. And you know, they have a very positive you know business focused idea of the thing out there. And yeah, I think it's I definitely recommend a bit of traveling to any young person that's going dairy farm, and even you know whether whether there's a farm to go home to or you know, they're thinking of going into an arrangement like Gordon has spoke about. I, I think definitely getting away for a few months to see a few things. That and of course, you had experience then of working with people on the large farms in New Zealand too, which will have stood to, I presume, in your current role. Yeah, definitely. So there was kind of four of us on the first farm and in the second farm was kind of three or four. And then... I worked there was a lot of a lot of people around and a lot of you know logistics I suppose and keeping you know getting herds of cows moving and having people there to milk the cows I suppose so yeah no that was definitely definitely a, a big experience and yeah it's helping now so I came home from New Zealand um, in March 2018 went into the greenfield I suppose where there was another team of people and a, a wider range of people in outside the, 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 the core farm team I suppose and you know, being able to deal with people really made that work for me, I suppose. Um, especially like on farms now where, you know, you can't do all the work yourself. So, you know, you need staff with you and you need relief makers and contractors and advisors and, you know, electricians and everything to, to make the thing go. So it's very important um, that you're able to, to, to work with people. Like. So um, I suppose just just a comment in terms of uh, how you found Greenfield and I suppose you came to my um came onto my radar with your reports that you used to be putting out on Twitter, which were always very frank and everybody loved them. So um, you just comment on how you came about doing that? or Yeah, I suppose. Um, well, it's funny. Greenfield was probably a project. I, I think I was on the Greenfield farm once before I took the job there. Um, it was something I knew I knew about Greenfield. And it's not that I chose to ignore it. It's just I didn't, it wasn't something I really followed. Um, I suppose uh, coming back from New Zealand, uh, um, there was kind of two jobs on the table when I came back from New Zealand. Um, both of them were Chagas, one was Greenfields and the other was um, one of the farms in Moorpark. Um, and I suppose, yeah, like Greenfield, I suppose, had, had gone through a bit of a rough patch in the beginning of 2018. And, you know, people were, you know, wondering what was going on. Um, and I suppose, you know, I was getting a bit of flack that, you know, why, why, are, why isn't there anything coming out of the farm? And I suppose it was just something I started and I didn't think, you know, I didn't think it would turn into what it did. Um, but it, it was very good, you know, to get the feedback. And I suppose um, a lot of people, you know, talk about the drought of 2018 and how the stuff I was putting on Twitter kind of helped them all cope with what they were dealing with because, you know, we got, we did get hit very bad with that drought. And I suppose we were dishonest and practical with what we were saying on, on the notes or what I was saying on the notes and just seemed to help a lot of people out. Um yeah honestly didn't think it was it had turned into what it did and I'm you know very surprised by the reaction. But yeah I'm glad that someone benefited um from from what I was saying. But I suppose like you know it's just like I'd have the kind of idea that you know farming you know to be good at dairy farming you just really need to be really good at the basics and that's what you know I try and focus on and you know back in the greenfields too, you know, we were just focusing on the really important things that make the thing work really well, and that's what I was trying to portray, I suppose, through the notes as well. Very good. Um, so then obviously we we all know that that wound down, and uh, you were probably at a loose end for a little while before you took the job that you're in now. Yeah. So yeah, I finished in greenfields the end of May uh, last year. So I spent I was very lucky to spend the summer in Moorpark. Um, uh, just doing, I suppose, a few different things. Um, in fairness, Pat, Pat Dillon really looked after me. Um, we were getting ready for the open day, and I was involved in a 
in a kind of a study there with two PhD students looking at animal welfare and lameness and all that kind of stuff. So I traveled most of Munster and all of South Leinster <laughs> looking at cows, getting up at crazy hours in the morning. But, um, you know, it is really good. And, you know, it's always good to get out on farms and see what, see what people are doing and hear what they're saying and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, and like then the Moor Park Open Day, was, it was great to see what went on behind the scenes and, you know, really proud to get the, the opportunity to, to be part of it, I suppose. Very good. And um, you're in, so, yeah. You're Sorry. in Wexford now? Yeah, so started in Wexford then um, just the beginning of last September. So um, so this is a new conversion. It's uh, 2020 is its third year in Wix. So there's, um, we're milking about 480 cows here this year on a 202 hectare milking block. Um, so yeah, new as I said, newly converted from tillage. So we're very lucky. We've really good facilities, and very labour efficient, um, and all our. So we just have cows here, I suppose, on this block. All our heifer calves and in calf heifers are up with any being reared up there. So um, yeah, it's a really really nice farm and a really nice location. Like, so yeah, very lucky to be working here with the cows. Okay, and uh, you followed the, the farm manager route. Um, would you hope to have something similar maybe to Keen in the future or what are your aspirations? Yeah, I suppose like owning my own cows is is a is a definitely an ambition of mine and I suppose it, it depends in on what route I go down. Like there's there's a lot of options and uh, as Paddy said, uh, you know, I think the trend of opportunities opening up is you know, is is going to continue. Um and I you know, I'm obviously very happy here where 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 I am, but you know, you always have to be kind of looking looking to the future, I suppose, as well. So but you know, it's something I'm thinking of, but you know, you know, very happy where I am at the minute anyway, and kind of just keeping my ear to the ground. But you know, you, there's no point in I you know, I don't want to be seen to be rushing into anything that's you know, that isn't the right thing. Like it's you know, get into a business arrangement or investment investing money is is a big step and you know, if it doesn't go right it you know it can set you back a few years like so you know so very happy where i am and you know always find that year out but you know we'll see how things go i suppose excellent very good so um i suppose i'll just ask people if they have any questions to put them through the q a down at the bottom there please and uh just while we're waiting for for questions to come in i'm sure there should be questions for for both kian and for david and uh for gordon and potty um so i suppose potty i just might ask you um in relation to the scale of the farm um, for the share farming arrangements, have you? Any, would you make any comment on that? Yeah, I would. And, and the first answer is going to start like a, sound like a cop out, Stuart. In that, uh, whenever I'm asked that question, I would always say to the person that if you're ready to get into a business arrangement like David is talking about and invest money, you should be able to tell me what scale is too small. Okay, and and I, I would stand by that answer because if you're not able to do a budget for a farm and look at what's dropping out the bottom line and look at the difference between a 100 cow farm and 150 cow farm, I don't think you have, you've developed yet the business skills that you need to do that. Um, so that would be the first answer. And, like it, and, and then the second one, I would actually encourage someone, and, and, and David mentioned there about not being in any rush, I would encourage someone, to, rather than rushing into something smaller, I would say take your time and aim for, uh, you know, if it takes you two or three years, to get into an arrangement that's 20 or 30 cows bigger maybe than you would have rushed into or that you could start today. Um, that bigger arrangement, just by nature of diluting your, your own labor costs and investment into it, uh, is is going to return. I, will, I, was, I had a lecture with uh, some of the farm manager students in, in Moor Park this week, and I was, I was saying to them that actually in, uh, ten, in 10 years of running a 130 cow lease farm, versus five years running a 160 cow lease farm, you could actually make the same amount of net profit uh, because you're diluting your own labor cost. Okay, so, so like why rush into the smaller scale farm if in five years at a bigger scale farm, you could achieve what you did in, in 10 years smaller, you know? So yeah. that's that, that's a comment I'd make on scale. Okay, so I suppose, uh, David, obviously you would have been involved in the sure. budgets and Greenfield and so forth because I know the team approach that was... Um, was employed there so would you care to comment on what party said there yeah definitely like i suppose getting the right farm is really important and having you know you, you can't go doing this on your own you, you know taking on a taking on a 120 or 120 cows in a partnership is you know there has to be a return in it and a, there has to be something there to 
motivate you, I suppose. Um, on the budgets, yeah, like I was very lucky to sit down with Lawrence and, you know, Park and all of, the, all of the team, I suppose. And, you know, we'd, we would have had very frank discussions about, you know, you know, obviously, the, you know, I suppose like the projects are, you know, these projects need very good performance to make them home. And I suppose that's something we can't, we can't forget about, like, you know, average performance in, in these arrangements doesn't you know it doesn't really wash you know there's big financial commitments and that kind of stuff and you know we would have been very honest and you, you know you know you can talk about the output of green fields and different things but you know these farms really have to be performing well and it's important that the person there then is you know is getting the reward to be motivated to drive the whole thing on um i suppose yeah, yeah so, it's just anything else on that yeah so um, off topic no um no you're uh you're obviously actively involved then in the farm that you're involved with currently with the budgeting aspect of it or kind of controlling the finances as well? Yeah, definitely. So we would have set out a budget at the start of the year. Um, you know, and uh, well, I suppose Sarah, Sarah Kehoe has a, a background in corporate finance, so she's, she's the, the Excel expert, I suppose. But um, yeah, no, we, we often, we'll always sit down and talk about it or, you know, the three of us will, you know, sit, sit down at the phone and talk about these things and, you know, it's updated every every month or every two months, and we we be tracking you know how we're going. You know, like you'd obviously have a fair idea, you know, of what we're spending. You know, if you're just looking in, you know, if you look onto your Glanbia Connect, you know, you'll see what your milk statements are saying, and you know, you'll have idea an idea of what you're spending on fertilizer and meal and stuff like that. So it's you know we'd always be watching it, but yeah, like the budget is really really important, and it's really important then to you know to see how you're tracking because you know. If you need to start, you know, if there needs to be money pulled back or saved somewhere, you know, it's now is the time to be doing it rather than when you get to the end of the year when you know your income is dropping off. I suppose. Okay, so Keen, um, from knowing Kevin, uh, you would have been actively involved in in all the financial stuff as well on the farm, and I suppose you have a probably a bigger challenge now in that David is three years down the line in Kios, but in with Finns, you're just obviously doing a lot of investment and development as well, so there's probably a, a bigger budgeting job needs to be done as well. So are, you're actively involved in that, I presume, as well. Uh, yeah, so I'd be fairly involved in the, the budgeting, definitely, of the, the running of the farm. Um, a lot of the building and construction was well underway or finished by the time I started here. And um, so there was a lot of, you know, all new cubicles, brand new parlor, all that. So there was a lot of money invested here last year. But in terms of feed and fertilizer, milk in and, and calves out and stuff like that, um, that's all, we'd all budget that together and kind of look, just look at every couple of months, as David said, and make sure we're on track to, to do what we plan to do. Very good. So um, I suppose there's actually no questions coming in from the audience. I hope it's working properly because I'm surprised that, that there isn't something coming in. But um, I suppose uh, the f- I, I think the emphasis should be coming across to people um, that there's such a requirement for flexibility between all parties. And if if anything isn't coming out, if if people aren't getting the message around communication out of today's webinar, I don't think we can ever... Uh, reiterate it any further than what it has been. Every one of the speakers today has em- emphasised the importance of the communication between both parties and how important it is that they can communicate well with one another. So I suppose from the point of view of, um, like like Paddy said there, having um, done lectures with the farm management students, they're getting the skill set that is required to deal with financial and communication and the two lads have alluded to there. Um, how they've been dealing with the financial aspects of the firms that they're involved with. Uh, so it's just important, I suppose, from the potential, I suppose, Gordon, I'll ask you to comment on this maybe, um, the landowners maybe that might be coming into the arrangements and they're possibly used to being on their own maybe for a long number of years and how they need to, is it, would you give them any advice in terms of how they adapt to bring in a person? Yeah, well, you say, Stuart, that they've worked probably many years on their own and they've, they've always done what, what they wanted, when they wanted and how they wanted. And now all of a sudden, maybe they're looking at going into a collaborative arrangement and having to accommodate another party. So, look, I suppose to, to go into any collaborative arrangement, you need to be open minded and you need to be flexible. And I suppose there has to be a big element of trust and honesty there uh, built up. 
And look, all this takes time. And I think one thing that's come from today is that we shouldn't be, or anyone thinking of going into these arrangements, shouldn't be rushing into them. They, um, they should build their experience and build their reputation because Ireland is a small country and reputation goes before us in a lot of cases. So when you come to look for your collaborative arrangement, whether it be a partnership or a share farming, people will make a couple of phone calls and they'll know very quickly what this lad or this lady is like. So I think build your experiences, build your knowledge and build a reputation for yourself that when you go to negotiate with a landowner, then you can come to, to, to some um, an arrangement that will work for both of you. Okay, very good. So I suppose I might leave the, the last word to the two lads. Um, Kian Singh, as we started with you, I suppose the one thing that stands out to you for people in your position, either looking for a farm management position or even as Paddy said um, before we started, maybe just looking to be to get a job on a farm that maybe have no aspirations to actually run manage the farm but want to work on a farm. What's the, the big thing for you? Uh, yeah, I think what Gordon said there about your reputation is is massive in this country. Um, every all big dairy farmers know each other, and um, so you know you have to just keep do what you're supposed to do, and just keep do the basics right. As uh, even if uh, just as a worker, be punctual. You know all that sort of thing is very important for starting out. Because um, as Gordon said, like it's a very it's a small looking country and a small community of farmers. And uh, um, in terms of the communication, I suppose, I, I know I'm bringing you back to it, but you said it like it's just a two-way process is, is important as well for no matter what role you're playing in the farm. Uh, yeah, definitely. The communication is sure it's massive in the, in, in the industry. Like it's the most important part I'd say of the, my, my job on it is communicating with the lads that the they're learning new skills. I'm learning new skills as well as we go. Like so, it's very important that we all communicate and and um, make sure it all works well. Very good. Now, David, you're getting the awkward one because Keen has taken the easy option there and given us the communication. But is there anything you'd say that's an important um, attribute of both the, the maybe the landowner or yourself as an employee? As I said, either coming in as the farm management person or coming in as a, a worker on the farm that is important i suppose like a lot of it is you know having a positive outlook on on the whole thing as well and a positive attitude you know to make the thing work and you know that's what you know hopefully what both people are there to do and i suppose it's you know having having a positive outlook and i, I suppose it's you know things you know going back to the budget and then stuff like that and all these kind of things and like ensuring good performance that you know if, if a thing isn't performing well and there's no money or whatever coming out of it it's you know, it's hard, it's hard for people to be happy. And I suppose like, you know, the good performance and stuff comes back to, you know, being a good manager and having the skills. And it's an, I suppose that's important for a young person getting into it. You know, you know, you need to be good at grass and you need to be good at, you, you know, looking after cows and heat detection and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, it just goes back to probably the basic, thing, basic things there as Keen has mentioned, you know, you just need to be, you know, if you are a young person, go off and get those skills and, you know, go work for people and, you know, just build on the skills and, you know, the more experience you have, the easier it will be. And, you know, don't be afraid either to, you know, to come out of your comfort zone. You know, like when I came back to Greenfields, it is, you know, it was, a, it was very daunting, but, you know, if you hit him, hit him hard, you know, you know, you, you'll make these things work. And it is like, it's not easy, like, you know, none of these things are, you know, a walk in the park, but, you know, if you put your head down, you'll get through them. And it's the same coming down to Wexford, like it's a, it's a bigger farm. And the, you know you, you will be afraid of these things, but you know if it doesn't scare you, it's it's not going to do anything for you at all. Like really, if you're not living out in the edge, you're taking up too much room. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I suppose, look, uh, f for me, what you said there, the two of you said there, have summed up a lot of things for me. Uh, communication is critical, and I think uh, I don't think Paddy or Gordon are going to disagree with me that even if you have a farm, people listening on online on online there at the moment even if people have a farm of themselves that they are intending to go home to i think both of the lads have alluded to the importance of going away to experience something different rather than just going straight home potentially and then um the basics getting the basics right and the other thing that again it comes back to communication i think we really underestimate uh the benefit of the discussion group model and so forth mm -hmm. and the number of people that are willing to help um, so I can guarantee you that I know that you, Kean, you can pick up the phone and ring Kevin if you need to talk to him about anything. He'll be there for to answer you, and I'm sure it's the same with David Baker, even though I don't know him. Um, mm -hmm. But like, 
the support network that you develop as you go along. Uh, and Mike Birmingham was on with us last week and he would rely on his support network of the farmers that are around him locally as well. And that's what's driven him to where he has been is he asks the questions, uh, he gets the solutions to the problem if there's a problem and it betters his farm for him. And the two of you have alluded to that situation as well in terms of how it's important to communicate with people. So I think uh, we'll um, leave it at that. I think we've really summed it up. I think trust, flexibility and communication. I think Gordon and Potty both said that. And then the skills, support and structure. Structure, structure is the cr critical thing from the point of any collaborative farming arrangement, whether it's a land lease or whether it's a contract heifer rearing or a share farming arrangement. Put it together like it's going to fall apart is probably the the best way that you can advise people, even though it sounds like a negative approach, and David said there that it's important to be positive, but you just have to build it up as if you're going to have to take it down at some point. So it's like putting a precast wall over a tank, because in case you had to replace the slats at some stage, just think of, think of the future. So we'll leave it at that. Oh, hang on, there's one question after coming in, God. We better. Uh, reputation is not easy to keep good. Any comments on that, lads? A tough one. <laughs> Paddy, do you want to make any comment on that? It's a bit of a bit of a curveball for the two boys. <laughs> um, I suppose reputation is. It, it, I, I wouldn't. Um, I think it, it's been rightly said how important it is, and, and because Ireland is such a small place, um, and I and I think really, I suppose. You know, if, if you make the decision of going to work on the right farm, it makes it a lot easier to try and develop a good reputation for yourself. So, like, the, the again, you know, the, probably the most important decision you're going to make is the people you decide to work with, either on, in employment or in an arrangement. And if you work with the right people, it becomes much easier to try and, you know, to do the job well and get on with them. And, like, I suppose there are cases where um, people have worked with the wrong people, it hasn't gone well, but have subsequently haven't had maybe a setback gone on to the next farm done their best job there like no one has a perfect record either you know i think that that that's a fair comment and i do know people who've gone in and maybe worked on farms and for whatever reasons personality clash and hasn't worked out but they've gone on to the next farm they've you know in a lot of cases i know they've excelled at that farm and and they've done their reputation really you know no harm because it's not going to be a perfect journey either and david highlighted that like that it's not it's not always easy yeah i suppose the, the point i'd make uh, is more often than not, if your reputation is good for every bad comment there is, there's probably 10 out there good that are for you. The only problem is that the bad comment is likely to travel a bit quicker. So if, like you said, if people, like Gordon said, there are people who pick up the phone, they'll make a few phone calls. They're not going to just make one call on a person. If they have a gut feeling about a person, they're going to follow up on it more. If they, if they have a gut feeling that they don't like you and they get a bad comment, then it's not meant to be probably. So it's far, far the best anyway. So I think, look, um, we'll finish up on that. I'd like to thank John Moriarty for organising today, for putting the, the background and the legwork into organising the whole uh, webinar today. Thank Gordon for his uh, presentation, Paddy for his input, and in particular to David and Keen for giving of their time and giving of their, their situations as well, because it's not everybody that will come online and tell exactly what they've done to date and explain how, what they're hoping to do into the future. So. Uh, big thanks to you all and uh, we look forward to seeing you all again next week. Next week we'll have Dan Crowley talking to us about um, using milk recording reports to uh, make better decisions around uh, cell count and so forth. And just a reminder that Emma Louise will be broadcasting uh, the LED's commentary on share farming and uh, options in dairying on, as a bonus podcast as part of the Dairy Edge podcast. Okay, so thanks very much everyone and take care and keep safe.